Hello, everyone. Today, we are joined by Jennifer Pepito, who is the mother of seven children that she has homeschooled from the beginning. When she discovered that her second daughter had learning disabilities, Jennifer became an avid student of child development, and her peaceful press resources were born out of years of research. She has a passion to equip families to homeschool in a way that is developmentally appropriate, spiritually nourishing, and based on proven methods of education. Jennifer is a simplicity parenting coach, a certified life coach, and is currently pursuing early childhood development credits in order to ensure that the families that use Peaceful Press are getting the best resources based on current research about learning. So I am really looking forward to this conversation today. And obviously I, I gave a brief bio there, but could you tell us a little about your family and yourself and how you guys got started homeschooling? Yes, for sure. And um, that was the bio off of my Peaceful Press website. So it didn't talk as much about um, my 25 years of homeschooling. I guess 20, my daughter is 27. We started in preschool. So I think she was about three years old when I went to my first Charlotte Mason uh, support group. It was for the book, The Charlotte Mason Companion by Karen Andriola. And so throughout the, you know, 20 some years of homeschooling, we've been doing nature study and reading beautiful books together and really creating a, um, a lifestyle of learning that is based on enriching our soul and our spirit through literature. So, and I have seven kids. The oldest is 27. She's in Belfast, Northern Ireland, finishing up a PhD in law. And then I have a 25 year old who has learning disabilities and she's at home pursuing some writing and art. I have also a 22 year old son in New Jersey, he graduated summa cum laude with a business degree and he's out there working. I have a son in the Coast Guard. And then I have four, um, three younger children who are still at home in 18, 14 and 12 year old. Oh, that sounds like a lot of adventures. And I bet a lot of really fantastic discussions with all those different perspectives and life experiences. Yes, for sure. It's definitely broadened our horizons. I, I told somebody the other day, though, that I'm going to stop sending my kids to, you know, one of our things that we've done as a family is send our children to a Bible school as kind of like a gap year. Um, we, we actually moved it to their senior year instead of graduating them earlier, we pushed the graduation date back a little bit so that they could do a Bible school as a senior in high school. But the, the problem with expanding your children's horizons in this way and letting them see the world is that they don't necessarily always come back. Or <laughs> so, so I'm like, how can we um, change this so that I have all my kids and grandkids as my neighbors? No grandkids yet, but. Yes. Oh yeah. Y'all are pretty spread out. Mm-hmm. Well, now you said you, your daughter was three when you went to a Charlotte Mason support group. So obviously you were interested in Charlotte Mason education from the beginning, but how did your kind of ideas about education grow and change over the years or did they? You know, a lot of things have actually stayed very consistent. I, I, along with learning about Charlotte Mason early on, I was reading Raymond Moore's books and there was one that was kind of a collection of stories of other families who were homeschooling because he was such a pioneer that it was almost like these pioneer homeschool stories. And one of them, they described their day and they, like the family, they got up and they washed some apples and made some oatmeal and took a nature walk. And then they sat down and read together and just, it described this dream life that I really longed for. And so throughout my homeschool years, even when we were missionaries in Mexico, or even when we were living in more of a suburban environment, we always kind of kept that consistency of a more natural learning lifestyle. And, you know, through the years, if I've gotten a little bit nervous about it, you know, if I've gotten scared because the schools keep pushing earlier and earlier learning and they keep incentivizing um, teachers pushing earlier and earlier learning. If I've gotten nervous about the fact that my kids may be at age five or six or even seven aren't going to look like they're on track or at grade level, I read John Taylor Gatto. If I'm nervous, I read John Taylor Gatto. <laughs> and, you know, he He's just so appalled at the way that this works out. And, you know, even an article I read recently, it talked about how there was a head start, some research done. I think it was an article by David, um, by Peter Gray on Psychology Today. But basically, there was a study done of children who were 
in an academic preschool versus children who were in a more natural preschool. And it found that by grade four, all the gains from the academic preschool had evened out. But then by adulthood, by like between ages 15 and 23, they still follow those kids. And the kids that had been in the academic preschool actually had much worse social outcomes, much worse. Um, many of them had been involved in crime who were involved in that academic preschool. And I think that what, what we can see from this kind of research is that if we, if we skip literature. And I think that it's it's dangerous because there's so many families now who are feeling pressure. Even in the Charlotte Mason world, they're like, oh, now Charlotte Mason means reading all of these books. And if I don't read these books, then we're going to fail. But if we don't um, take the pressure off a little bit and focus on character and story and, and building a whole child, we're going to see the same kind of results. Kids who maybe they know a lot, but they don't care a lot. Right. And that's, you know, Charlotte Mason talks about how at the end of our education, it's not how much a child knows, but how much they care. I was recently talking with another veteran homeschool mom um, and her episode will, will publish later this spring, but she was saying so many things that resonate with what you said as well. And I think that listening to moms who have been doing this for a while and have seen children graduate and go into adulthood can be so helpful and encouraging to new young homeschool moms because we can put so much pressure on ourselves, you know, read all the blog posts and listen to all the podcasts and, you know, think, okay, I've got to do all these things. And the volume is not going to necessarily, and in fact, likely won't bring added benefits to your children, doing fewer things, but doing them well and with joy and wonder is going to be so much more valuable. A hundred percent. Absolutely. I, I feel like you know, our children so much pick up on our own attitude about life. And so if they see us approaching education as this like perfectionistic competition, you know, competition oriented pursuit where, oh, if I don't read all of these volumes or if I don't, you know, teach from this set of literature that Charlotte Mason taught from in the 1800s, then we're failures. They're going to pick up on that. And, and it, you know, I've seen some really great families who were doing a really good job end up with kind of heartless children. I think that that's what that kind of, um, the focus on competition, the focus on making it about perfectionism, it, it's not good for our spirit. Do you know what I mean? We, you know, we are called as believers to love. We're called to, you know, love our neighbors, um, to love God. And and when when we make things kind of more about ticking off boxes, I think it's harder to be oriented towards love. Yeah, in season one of the podcast, I chatted with Dr. George Grant, who's one of my mentors, and he said that we basically live out a practical works righteousness. We would never say that with our, with our lips, right? We would say the right theology, but what our children are actually seeing is basically that we hold a works righteousness. And that's so convicting and, you know, something to be mindful of. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, what were some of your favorite aspects of homeschooling? And then were there any challenges that you faced? Uh, well, definitely my favorite aspect still is morning time. It's such an anchor to our day to, you know, gather and um, we're working through the Playful Pioneers and it's kind of a second edition. It's from the Peaceful Press. And so we're reading the Little Britches stories every morning and they're they're so compelling. Like yesterday in our reading, um, they get lost in the forest in Colorado and Little Britches realizes that he was in a competition with this old man who who didn't necessarily have um, the ability at this point in his life to best him. And, and so there's this whole dialogue that's going on inside of Ralph Moody's head that is directed towards compassion. And I just love how, you know, when we choose books that are living, that have living ideas, we're, we're able to communicate so much to our children that really sticks with them. And even the geography, and um, we have just been learning some memory work about mountains in the United States. But then in the Little Britches chapter, one of the cowboy characters is talking about Pike's Peak and about the history of Pike's Peak. And he's got a little song, you know, so my kids are going to remember that so much more than um, our memory work. But, you know, so the reading out loud, the, the morning time, memorizing scripture, being able to read, you know, the prayers of St. Patrick. This morning we were reading the Nicene Creed. It's such a beautiful opportunity to instill in our children our own family values, our own culture, biblical values in this really conversation oriented, a really Socratic 
oriented morning meeting. And then as far as challenges, um, I have one daughter who has learning disabilities. Um, she, you know, she's been diagnosed through the years as sensory processing disorder or an, uh, like a neurodevelopmental delay. Um, and so that's been, that has been challenging because with our kids, we, we have such high expectations and hopes for them. We want, we want them to have a full life. And, and, you know, with kids, I think that this can apply to everybody. Um, kids aren't all the same, you know, and we can set out homeschooling thinking that we're going to have this one outcome, but really children are not plastic. We can't, they're not, they're not um, clay to be molded. You know, they're all so different and unique. And, you know, there's an element of having to be witnesses in some ways to their development, just being really prayerful. We pray for our kids. We, we hope for the best. We speak life over them, but, you know, being a little bit flexible has, has been important for me because I did start out as kind of a perfectionist and having very high expectations for my kids, but there, there's an element of having to just accept people for who they are and, and love them where they're at instead of always, you know, expecting something more. Which is very much goes along with Charlotte Mason's idea that children are born persons. I like to say that homeschooling is not a vending machine. You know, you don't push the buttons and get out the product of the certain child. Um, and so in one sense, we think, oh, no, we want all that control. But in another sense, I am so relieved that it's not all up to me pushing the right buttons in the right order that I can rest in the work of God in my children's life. Yeah, that's really good, Amy, because I think a lot of parents, and, and unfortunately, we were sort of taught in the earlier homeschooling movement that, you know, do this, you know, raising kids God's way, or you know what I mean, train up a child. It's like, there was an element of, of this, like, do this, and you'll get this result. But I think a lot of those people actually just had young children. <laughs> they didn't, you know, I don't think people should teach parenting until they have grandkids, you know what I mean? Until, like, as long as your kids are in your home, and you are the one feeding and clothing them, you don't really have as much authority as you think you do. You know what I mean? They, they have to do what you say. So I think that we have to be careful as teachers to not over promise when we really don't have the experience to deliver. Oh, definitely. I'm a second generation homeschooler. So I see a lot of that fruit of, and unfortunately, a lot of people who were so committed to following a certain set of rules and ideas, and if they did everything right, then everything was going to turn out okay. And unfortunately, that's not what ended up happening. You have a lot of my peers who left the faith or, um, you know, just have had their own struggles. I mean, we all have struggles, but um, yeah. So I think that that perspective, having seen that not work, has been a, a good reminder to me in my own family. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think it's important. One of the things that I, I really teach in a lot of my writing is the power of forgiveness and reconciliation, because I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of second generation homeschoolers are going like the complete opposite way, whether it's with their faith or their child rearing or whatever. And I've done this myself in my own family. You know, you, you decide something's bad. And so instead of you know, kind of forgiving and, and almost like cutting off the results of that, you try the exact opposite, you know, and that's not necessarily right either. Yeah, definitely. Well, obviously you have the peaceful press and we talked about, um, I talked about that earlier, but I think that one of the things I wanted to especially talk to you about was this early childhood years, thinking about that piece in preschool and kindergarten, because that's somewhere I see a lot of pressure that moms are putting on themselves, you know, in the Facebook homeschool groups. I just want to tell them, I'm like, just leave. You shouldn't even be here right now because <laughs> they come in and they've got their three-year-old and they're like, what's the best curriculum? And they don't know how to read yet. And they're just so anxious. So what are some ways that we can encourage wonder and really lay a foundation for peaceful, joyful, um, you know, future love of learning in those little years. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I was the same way. I mean, I was at my first homeschool meeting when my oldest was three years old. And I think that there's, and, and Cindy Rollins in her book, Mere Motherhood, I mean, I think she was reading about Charlotte Mason before she even had children. So I think it's natural and normal and perfectly wonderful for us to start researching and thinking about it early. But as long as we take the pressure off. And, you know, the one the one thing that I actually, um, I, I don't disagree with, with Charlotte Mason, but because I have a daughter with special needs, I've seen that if you just completely do nothing in the first six years, and I don't think that's what she was recommending, but I think sometimes Charlotte Mason educators think, oh, the first six years of quiet growing time, so I can't do anything with my child. I think that, you know, that could actually 
end up being counterproductive because, um, you know, with my special needs child, especially she needed some sensory experience and she wasn't necessarily going to go for herself because like finger paint felt uncomfortable for her or she didn't like getting her hands dirty. So, you know, not all children are going to go after the experiences that they need for development. And so I think that presenting, um, you know, whether you have some sensory trays out or you have some clay, I, I think that we do have to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, say this in a wrong way, but but basically I think that it is really important to present some preschool related material for young children because not every home is set up. Uh, you know, Charlotte Mason era, they probably had a nursery where it was very child friendly. So if you're, if you don't have that atmosphere that's kind of welcoming, conducive to children learning, and it's funny too because Charlotte Mason says, don't alter your atmosphere for the child in a sense, but I think that she was probably tutoring in beautiful English nurseries, right? right. Well, she didn't have to worry about electrical outlets. <laughs> right, right. There's, you know, it's, it's a, di a different era. So, so I do believe in, in preparing an atmosphere for children to learn, whether that is having some shelves down low, where there are some puzzles and things that a preschooler can get out, or whether it's making sure that you have some good picture books for them to draw from. And I think most moms are doing this anyhow, you know, what we do at the Peaceful Preschool and um, the Nature Guide is we just give parents some ideas of what to do. Because I think, especially once we get going homeschooling the older children, we're like, uh, how do I find time to balance all this? You know, and the other thing that I would say is don't push those older children on too fast. You know, like we're still doing a lot of the Playful Pioneers activities with my 12 and 14 year olds. Some of that is shaking butter. Some of that is watercolor painting. And those projects, those experiences, those kind of more sensory experiences, why, why should our older children be pushed into heavier and heavier books and have no opportunity to unwind creatively? Like as adults, we still need that. We still need an opportunity to unwind and, and to do some kind of slower learning to incorporate, you know, baking into your day. I mean, there's so many, so many ways to have a balanced approach to learning that bring more joy to us. And I think that the reason that we don't have that balanced approach is we get scared. And I can definitely tell you, like, you know, I have two college graduates, four high school graduates, the, the, it didn't take pushing every day. It didn't take these long lists and huge stacks of books. It took having a lifestyle of learning where we were reading aloud a lot. We were discussing the books we read. So my children had a fantastic vocabulary. They knew how to dialogue. They knew how to think. And so then they could go into college classes and do really well. But it wasn't because, you know, we were doing a full day of learning every day or we read every single book on the Ambleside Online list. And, and I think those are great lists. But I just, I would want moms, especially just take some pressure off. Don't push children too fast into academic learning but make sure that centered around, you know, quiet routines, some sensory activities like baking or painting or clay um, and really good books. I mean, always books. Our local library branch actually just opened up today for the first time since last spring. Mm -hmm. And we were there early before the doors opened. We wanted to be the first ones inside. And my little five-year-old, we sort of have this it's become a family tradition that when you can sound out your first book, you know, like a Bob book kind of thing, then you get to have your own library card. And so it's sort of just become a tradition. And so he's been waiting for the library to open back up so he could go and get his library card. And just to see the joy on his face as he had his own bag and his own library card. And he just went, I just let him pick whatever books he wanted off the shelf. And so when we came home, everyone had their books and my two middle daughters, they were like, do we have to finish all the things on our list today? Or can we just read our books? I was like, yes, you can just read your books because you can't do that every day, but it's the joy and the experience and that, I mean, what kind of homeschool mom would I be if I was like, no, you can't read your books, go do the grammar worksheet or something. Right. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's, I, I do love the kind of natural element of Charlotte Mason language arts, you know, because you think about if you read a story and then you, you do some copy work on that story, you talk about it, that's so much more effective than having to do a worksheet for every single part of grammar, you know, every, like do a spelling worksheet, 
do a grammar worksheet, do a handwriting worksheet, when most of that could be accomplished by reading out loud, talking about what you read and narrating it, writing about it. So, you know, I, I, I love how practical Charlotte Mason is, especially if you don't overcomplicate it by trying to, you know, copy exactly what they were doing then, like copy the principles, but not I don't think we need to try and do exactly every single book that they read and, and, you know, exactly what an English governess in that time period was doing. Yeah. Curriculum is our tool, not our master, no matter right. what the curriculum is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think some of this has already been touched on a little bit, but if you were talking to a new homeschool mom or a mom of littles who is considering homeschooling, you know, what advice would you want to give to that mom? Yeah, I think one of the most important things would be to take some time to observe your child. You know, I, I think that we can, even in a Charlotte Mason homeschool, tailor learning to our children and give them space to learn. You know, she talks about having the full afternoon devoted to outdoor play. And if you let your child play outside and you start to see them, uh, you know, they're interested in building something or they're looking at the bugs or they are taking a book outside and laying on a blanket and reading it, you can kind of see what interests them and start to think about future plans. What, what living books are we going to read? To some degree, you can tailor your, your Charlotte Mason homeschool to your children. And then the other thing is, you know, because we want to know our children, I think being willing to flex what kind of homeschooling you're doing based on your child's personality, you know, I, I do have one child who really loves grades. And so letting her be in a class with a tutor where she gets a grade is, is helpful for her in some subjects. You know, another child is really interested in project-based learning. And so maybe making more time for that child to do projects or ordering a tinker crate, something like that, where it incorporates some of what makes that child come alive. Because I, I want my kids to look back on their school years and be excited about learning you know, feel like it wasn't just this big, long chore, but feel excited. And I think, you know, that's one of the important things about not over scheduling. That would be the second piece of advice is don't, don't try to do too much. Don't over schedule because, you know, when you give your child a day to pursue their own interests, or you keep the schooling, you know, just in the morning and you keep it sticking to the basics, I think you'll be surprised at all the things your child wants to learn. You know, in my children's free time, they have pursued learning Icelandic or drawn maps or, you know, pursued photography or animation. There's so many things that children will want to learn on their own if we just give them a little bit of time to do that. And I think that's such an important piece of education is backing off a little bit and letting our children pursue some of their own interests. I love that. And I love the variety of, of examples you gave too. You know, sometimes we think, oh, well, my kid hasn't like started their own business at 12 or something. You know, you hear like some crazy story and you're like, oh no, my child doesn't seem to be using their free time productively. <laughs> but if you really love and value that child as that unique person that God's made them to be, it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, just what ideas and curiosities are sparking in their imagination. Yeah. And I think that that is, really the result of a little bit of time. You know, when we over schedule, they never have the time. And you can start to see, you know, I, I know some people talk about how they put their kids in public school and they saw the light go out in their eyes. But I think the light can go out in the eyes of homeschool kids too, if we are over scheduling and, and just making it kind of this slog without any interest or respect in what they are interested in. Yeah. Well, I am asking these final two questions to all of my guests this season. And so the first question I have is just, what are you personally reading lately? Oh, how fun. I'm, I'm actually, I'll, I'm, I have them right here. I'm reading this one. It's A Long Obedience in the Same Direction by Eugene Peterson. I love reading some kind of contemplative or spiritual growth books. I feel like when my relationship with the Lord is in line when I am, when I am dwelling in the presence of God, when I'm living close to his heart, then it's a lot easier for me to create the atmosphere of peace and, you know, make space for God in our home, which blesses our children. And then I, I finished, I just finished this one. It's Honest Simple Souls by Anne White. Um, Cindy Rollins talked about it. She's an advisory member for the Ambleside Online curriculum, but it was kind of an advent and it had little excerpts from Charlotte Mason's Ourselves. And it was lovely. So many great ideas in there. And then I'm also reading the 
one year Bible. So this is fun. I'm, I'm working on an update for our ancient history resource, the precious people. So it's been kind of fun to be reading through the chronological Bible, you know, as I'm, as I'm writing about old Testament history, I'm reading about it. Huh. That, those are all really delightful ones. We are in the Old yeah. Testament right now in our family devotions. And man, getting through the end of Judges and you've just hit the low point. And then we started Ruth last night and we're like, phew. <laughs> right. I know. I know some of those lists of names and, you know, long, long chapters of laws can be a slog. But I really, you know, I want to make sure that I'm getting the whole heart of God and really being a good listener, you know. Yeah, definitely. Well, the next question is, what tip would you have for the homeschool mom when the homeschool day just seems to be going all wrong? <laughs> yeah, definitely stop. Just stop, you know, because I think there's a point where our kids can't learn anymore. And if we think that pushing them to tears is going to result in something, we're wrong. And, and maybe, you know, maybe this means that we need to back up and work on obedience training. Like we can't homeschool kids who won't listen to us. It's just not going to work. And I think that there, you know, there has been a lot of like, I had a lot of conflict in my own heart. Did I expect too much from my older children? Was I too strict with them? But I think that when children know that somebody else is in charge, it gives them a sense of peace and security. And so if you haven't yet established with your children that you are the leader of the little ship, that you're the captain and they're the shipmates, then you're not going to be able to get a lot of homeschooling done. So I think, you know, backing up a little bit and making obedience into a game, you know, play Mother May I or play um, Simon Says and just practice having your children actually do what you say what you tell them to do. And, and I, I have one child that it's like the most, you know, we experimented with more kind of um, egalitarian parenting, I guess, for a while. And I'm still working out the kinks on that one. But I think that it is important if you want to homeschool to establish that you're the boss, but then also be a respectful boss. You know, if you're, if you see that your child's worn out with what they're trying to learn, it's just not working, stop and play a board game, you know, play, you're doing math, they're crying, stop and play a math game. You're, you're doing a grammar worksheet, they're crying, stop and read a book out loud and talk about what you read. There are, there are more fun ways to accomplish the same purpose with our children, ways that are, are respectful and kind. And, and not that you do that every day, but I think that we overemphasize academics. Um, William Rauer was a Berkeley professor of education. And he said, um, all of the basic skills necessary for success in high school can be taught in only two or three years of formal skill study. You know, so I think that we spend, you know, the first six years of our children's home, like their, ele like their elementary years, trying to cram all this academics. And it could be done in a way that gives both of us a lot more of a joyful life. Like as a mom, you're interested in poetry, read poetry together. You know, as a mom, you love baking, read recipes together and make recipes. There are other ways to accomplish the same purpose beside doing every single thing that a curriculum tells you to do. I love that. That is such a good encouragement. Well, Jennifer, this has been delightful. Thank you for chatting with us today. Can you please tell us where people can find you all around the internet and a little bit about what they can find over at Peaceful Press? Yeah, if you go to thepeacefulpress.com, we have lots of free downloads. We have a free sample of our elementary resources. And I created the Playful Pioneers, the Kind Kingdom, and the Precious People as resources to help Charlotte Mason moms who were also busy. You know, I was homeschooling seven, I had seven children. So I was trying to homeschool and take care of toddlers. And I wanted fine art and I wanted poetry, but I didn't necessarily have time to go to a bunch of different sources to pull it together for myself. And I didn't have a lot of money either. So basically, when you buy our elementary resources, you get 30 weeks of learning. The lesson plans are laid out for you. There's Bible memory. There's poetry. There's a weekly art piece. Um, there's recipes. And, and there are some beautiful literature included. So it makes a really sweet Charlotte Mason year that's, um, that leaves time for your children to learn what they want to learn and for you to be a person as well. And then we also have the Peaceful Preschool and the Nature Guide, which are a, a little bit more Montessori leaning. We still have wonderful literature and art, but um, in the early years, I want to make sure that children get lots of time for fine and large motor skills, practice and development, because if you, you know, if you can't use your pincher grip properly, you're not going to be able to do the longer copy work that needs to be done. 
And if both sides of your body aren't coordinated well, your brain won't be coordinated well. You're going to have a hard time tracking words to read. So I think we underestimate the importance of that kind of those motor skills development actually has a huge impact on learning later on being able to read well and listen and repeat and track words on a page. So um, those are our resources. You can at the peacefulpreschool.com or the peacefulpress.com, you can download free resources. We have a free packet of planning materials with a loop schedule for Charlotte Mason families. Um, so there's lots of freebies on there. And uh, you can use code NEWFRIEND for 10% off anything in our shop. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And I will have links to all of those things in the show notes for this episode at humilityanddoxology.com. Thanks, Jennifer. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Amy. It was a pleasure to speak with you all.